Now, uh, why do I show this picture? We don't have nuclear submarines. No, but we have nuclear reactors. And the large vessels in the nuclear reactors, they become radioactive waste. So the question is, where are they going to go? And at the present time, the federal government accepts no responsibility for that. That's your responsibility. So when you buy into a nuclear power plant, you're making a long-term commitment to uh, cope with these kinds of problems. I've been trying to uh, um, convince Alberta politicians that this is worth thinking about ahead of time rather than waiting until it's over and then having to worry about it. Uh, of course, that's a difficult thing to do because the Alberta politicians generally say, look, this is not a public project. This is a private project. It's private money. It's private capital. Government has nothing to do with this. I mean, other than imposing a certain regulation, they're going to pay the tab. Oh, yeah? Uh, that's, that's dubious when you're talking about these periods of time. So. Um, now, uh, these, this is a gentleman looking at steel. These are steel cases containing nuclear waste. And they've decided to stop using those steel cases. And now they're building underground concrete bunkers to put the same radioactive waste. Nobody knows what they're going to do after that, because that's not a permanent solution either. Um, Bob took this picture. He has a kind of an interesting sense of humor. It's a little sign that says, stop. Take two seconds, safety thought. And he likes this sign because in terms of uh, waste which is dangerous for 10,000 years or 20,000 years or 10 million years, he thinks maybe it is appropriate to take two seconds to think about the waste. Uh, now, um, moving on to the last topic here, and the one which really got me involved in this issue in the first place, is the proliferation of nuclear weapons. What's the connection between peaceful nuclear power and nuclear weapons? Surely there isn't any. I certainly didn't think there was any, and most Canadians didn't think there was any, until uh, you learn otherwise. And of course, uh, most Canadians were, uh, a lot of Canadians were shaken out of their complacency by the fact that in 1974, India exploded its first atomic bomb using plutonium produced in a Canadian nuclear reactor, which we gave to India as a gift. And what happens here is this. The first two atomic bombs were the Hiroshima bomb and the Nagasaki bomb. The Hiroshima, these are models of those two bombs. Uh, the Hiroshima bomb was made of what's called highly enriched uranium. And uh, it was called Little Boy. And the Nagasaki bomb, which is behind there, was, was, was fueled with plutonium, a man-made element which doesn't exist in nature. And that was called Fat Man. Now, it turns out that there are only two strategic nuclear materials, and they are highly enriched uranium and plutonium. The reason why people are upset about our, the idea of Iran building a, a uranium enrichment plant is that anybody who has a uranium enrichment plant can enrich the uranium to a high degree and build bombs if they want to, because that's how those types of bombs are built. Um, of course, uh, they themselves have enrichment plants, and all the uh, the powers that produce nuclear weapons of their own, they have these enrichment plants, but they certainly don't like the idea of other countries having them. Now, these two strategic nuclear materials are derived from the two main isotopes of uranium that exist in nature, which are called uranium-235. Uranium-235 is the fissile variety of uranium. Fissile means it undergoes fission. That's the one that actually produces the energy in the bombs and in the reactors. Plutonium-238 is called fertile. It's not fissile, it's fertile. And what that means is that when it's hit with a neutron, it doesn't actually split, but it absorbs the neutron and is transmuted into a new element, which is plutonium. So that's the difference between them. But it also means that whenever you are splitting uranium atoms inside a reactor uh, to get energy, some of those neutrons are going to be hitting uranium-238 atoms, and those uranium-238 atoms are going to simultaneously be turning into plutonium. So in this way, you are breeding or creating this new radioactive material, plutonium. And it turns out that plutonium is a dandy nuclear explosive. It's a more powerful nuclear explosive even than uranium-235. And it's much easier to get at once you have separated it from the uranium it's much easier to get at because uh, it's chemically different from uranium. So you can use chemistry to separate them. 
You can't separate U-235 from U-238 very easily. You can't separate plutonium very easily, but it's a lot easier than separating U-235 from U-238. That's the main difference. So plutonium is the principal nuclear explosive in the world. Now, uh, here we have a picture of, uh, this is in Quebec City, and it was taken in 1941. And we see uh, Winston Churchill on the right-hand side there. And we see President Roosevelt in the middle. And we see Prime Minister Mackenzie King on the left. This is the time when they signed what's called the Quebec Agreement. And the Quebec Agreement was an agreement between these three countries to cooperate in building the world's first atomic bombs. Uh, and they said in the agreement that they would not use these weapons against each other. And they would also not use it against any third party unless they had unanimous consent. So as a result, all three countries had to agree on the use of the atomic weapons. Uh, that was the Quebec Agreement insofar as nuclear weapons are concerned. Now the reason Canada was included in that is because we had the only known supply, easily available supply, of uranium on the North American continent through a mine up in the Northwest Territories at Port Radium. Uh, now, I would like to uh, Canada participated, by the way, in producing both of those strategic nuclear materials, both the uranium and the plutonium, for the Hiroshima bomb and for the Nagasaki bomb. Now, you've often heard the phrase, perhaps, the nuclear fuel cycle. But you know, if you look at it, it doesn't look like a cycle. It looks more like a chain. It goes from A to Z, but it doesn't go back to A again. So why do they call it a nuclear fuel cycle? We actually prefer the word nuclear fuel chain. Because you go from the mine to the mill to the refinery, then you fabricate it into fuel, and then it goes into the reactor, and then it comes out in the spent fuel bay, and then it goes to Never Never Land, and uh, never heard from again. So why is this called a nuclear fuel cycle? Well, it turns out that the nuclear fuel cycle refers to two, two, two components. One of them is called enrichment, which we've already mentioned something about, and the other one is called reprocessing. Enrichment is a way of increasing the percentage of U-235. And if you do that to a high enough degree, you can make the highly enriched uranium for bombs. The other thing you can do is you can take the spent fuel from the spent fuel bay, or from the dry storage, or from the geological repository even, and you can reprocess it in order to extract the plutonium. And that plutonium can also be used either for peaceful purposes, as fuel for nuclear reactors, or it can be used also for bombs. So uh, uh, just quickly going through this, because I know it's getting on, and we've used up a lot of time already. Uh, I'm sure you'd like me to wind this up, and then we can have questions. Uh, what is uranium enrichment? As I said, here's a picture of an enrichment plant. By the way, when they say that nuclear power doesn't contribute to greenhouse gases, one of these enrichment plants uh, uses more energy than a large city. And most of that is greenhouse gas producing. Also, to get the uranium out of the ground, in order to get 7,000 tons of uranium out of the ground in the Elliott Lake area, which is typical of the old-fashioned uh, mines, and also typical of the mines in other parts of the world, you need to extract 70 million tons of ore. That's a huge amount of greenhouse gases that are produced just by before the fuel is even ready to go into the reactor. So when people tell you that nuclear power does not contribute to greenhouse gases, that's not entirely correct. Uh, it does. It does at both the front end and the tail end of the nuclear fuel chain. But here's the nuclear reactor, uh, here's the nuclear enrichment plant. And what it does is this. It takes the two types of uranium, and by a very energy intensive process, it manages to increase the percentage of uranium-235. That gives us enriched uranium. And it leaves behind, the only way you can increase the percentage of U-235 is to throw away a lot of U-238. And that which comes out the back door is called depleted uranium. So depleted uranium is the opposite of enriched uranium. 